Good evening. Good evening. And it is late. <laughs> but uh, I am happy to be here and thank you, Adrian and Alexander. Did that for my name, double A. How about that? And to the uh, pre-law summit, the HBCU pre-law summit, to all of the students and uh, to all of those who have guided you through this process, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here and I want to thank you for this award. It is indeed very special. But it's always special for me to be back on uh, this campus uh, where I began my HBCU experience 53 years ago. So I can tell you that nothing could be finer than to be back in Greensboro, North Carolina on the campus of North Carolina A&T State University, Aggie Pride. Aggie Pride. Right. I want to just uh, let you know how proud I am of you, uh, all of you, for uh, what you're doing, for the challenge that you're taking, uh, for all that you've done to, to get to this point. And I've got to tell you that uh, I come uh, HBCU born. I am an Aggie twice. Let me just make that clear. And I was able to come to North Carolina A&T State University. Unlike most of you, I guess I wasn't fully prepared academically. Grew up in Newark, New Jersey, and my mom uh, didn't finish high school, didn't go to an HBCU or any CU for that matter but she understood how important education would be in my life. And so she inspired me and she encouraged me. She did domestic work. She cleaned other folks' houses so I wouldn't have to do that. And I haven't had to do it. I need to clean my own. But she knew that education would be my passport and it clearly has been. So I came like many of you as a first generation college student arriving with very little money, not much of anything else. But A&T made a committed investment in me. They believed in the opportunity that W.E.B. Du Bois spoke about when he said of all of, the, of all of the civil rights for which the world has fought for and struggled for, for more than 500 years, the right to learn is undoubtedly the most fundamental. And so I believe in opportunity because an HBCU believed in that opportunity for me and that's why I am working so hard in the Congress. I'm dealing with 45, <laughs> you know, and you all need to stay woke so you understand what's going on. Yeah, I've got two grand, four grandchildren and two children, so I, I, I know the lingo a little bit. But I was able to come to North Carolina A&T to complete my bachelor's degree and my master's degrees here and to go on to Columbus, Ohio to the Ohio State University to earn my PhD, but only because of the North Carolina A&T. And so I certainly want to just uh, praise uh, my school and all HBCUs, because I know what they do for, for us. And so I'm a witness, like most of you, that where you start out in life, doesn't have to determine how far you can go or just where you'll end up. So I'm a proud Aggie twice. I'm a former professor from Bennett College. I taught 40 years. Those, any Bennett Bells in the house? Bennett Bells are voting bells. And so I continue to be a fierce advocate for HBCUs and our students nationwide. And so while I was here in North Carolina, in the North Carolina House, I worked hard through the Legislative Black Caucus and the foundation to uh, make sure that we had the funds for our students and scholarships. And we're continuing to pursue those efforts right now in Congress. I'm, I think I'm the only one up here that's not a lawyer, but I gotta tell you that we got a lot, lot of lawyers uh, in Congress. A lot of them are, are, are members of Congress, but many of them just work there. My chief of staff has a law degree not from an HBCU, so we talk about that. But the point is, um, the point is uh, there's a lot that you can do. And uh, I heard the, the speaker earlier talk about she's teaching and so forth. But so it gives me an opportunity while I'm in Congress to learn a little bit not only about the law, but to help make them. 
And uh, that's a good thing, to help shape public policy. And I've got to tell you, you don't change it. If you don't like public policy, you don't change it until you change the policy makers. So I'm hoping that all of you out there, I'm hoping that all of you, I don't want to get up here and start talking about voting, but you know, you make sure you do that. Uh, because while policy makers shape policy, it is you, the citizens, who make us the policy makers. And so somebody is going to make a decision for and about you most times without you. So you need to be in a position, as I put myself in, with the help of the citizens, primarily here in Guilford County, where I got my start. Well, you need to be able to control those of us who make those decisions on your behalf. And so I want to just say that we have uh, a, a lot of um, a good lineage in our schools. And uh, those of you, you have a rich heritage if you attended an HBCU at, at any way, at, at any time. And we account for less than 20% of college African-American enrollment, but we produce more than 25% of STEM graduates and 80% of lawyers. But then when you look around, uh, we don't see, we don't have enough lawyers that look like you. So if that's what you want to do, I'd say go for it. But I also would encourage you, as I have worked hard and we're going to be working next week is H National HBCU Week. You all know that. We're celebrating you in Washington, D.C. We're celebrating you in the Congress. And uh, we have prepared through the... Um, uh, through the uh, CBC's annual Legislative Congress, the first HBCU brain trust, and my office is leading that. So uh, if you're in the neighborhood, we want you to, to come in and join us and, and to network not only with other students and, and faculty and, and, uh, and, and members uh, of, the, uh, of the, the corporate community. That's some good networking that will go on. But then I want you to make sure that you let the Congress know uh, that what you do count, that the schools that you have attended and are attending count, and that we've got to make sure that they consider education as a priority. Uh, because I can tell you that our campuses and our students are under siege right now. And we've got to speak up. We've got to stand up. And if you like Alma Adams, you're going to have to cut up sometimes. <laughs> but that's all right. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a way to not only get the attention. And so we've got to tell Mr. President to remove the cuts from the education budget, to invest more in higher education, to reduce student debt. I know you all got some. And don't uh, eliminate campus-based aid. You know, I don't understand why they even want to do that. I always had to work when I was in school. Don't eliminate work study and by all means we've got to expand Pell so that it is year round because I know you're in school year round. And so I just want to remind you that America is graying. I've been out here for 34 years. The Lord has allowed me to go from school board to Congress. Uh, from walking the, 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 the streets of, of Newark, New Jersey to now the, the halls of the U.S. Capitol. And I'm grateful for the opportunity because I got my start at an HBCU. And had it not been for the education that I received at North Carolina A&T, uh, I would not be where I am today. And of course, with the help of the good Lord who guided me all the way. So remember, as you give to your nation and all the things that you're going to do and and the communities that you're going to give back to. Indeed, it's really about the folks that you're going to serve. Uh, make sure that as you climb this ladder of success that you reach back and that you pull somebody else up along. And remember to make sure you reach back and give back uh, to your schools. And one final thing I want to remind you of is what Emerson said a long time ago that, that most of the shadows in one's lifetime stand and most of the shadows in one's lifetime come from standing in one's own sunshine. So don't stand in your own sunshine. And don't allow anybody else to block your view. Thank you. God bless. <laughs>